Greetings, and welcome to the Mowgli Memories Podcast. We have a very special episode for you today, a celebration of 10 years under the leadership of Nick Robbins and his wonderful wife, Diana. I'm Wayne King, the host of this podcast. I came to Mowgli in 1963, really by accident. Mowgli's director, who had just taken over because of the Holt Elwell Foundation's formation and Mowgli's new status as a nonprofit camp, had a bit of an emergency near the beginning of the summer. His nurse was in an automobile accident and unable to come to camp. Bill Hart wandered into my dad's barber shop with one week to go before the opening of Mowgli. And as uh, often happened, uh, he told his troubles to his barber. And my dad stepped back and he said, Bill, do I have a deal for you? But you'll have to take two little girls who will fall in love with Mowgli immediately and my son as a part of that deal. Bill Hart shook his hand and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. I came to Mowgli as a cub, went through the entire program. My mom was there for four years as the nurse. And when she left to go back to nursing full time, Bill Hart stuck with me as, a, as Well, there's no other way to say it. I, I was a scholarship kid. My family couldn't have afforded to send me to Mowgli. But Bill Hart stuck with me, and I stuck with him for many years after I had graduated as a canoeing instructor under Charlie Walbridge, learning the ropes. learning to be a good trip guide from Jim Boycourt and Andy Poppinchalk. And eventually I became trip master at Mowgli. It was a glorious adventure. And every day I woke up and said, I can't believe they pay me to do this. But Mowgli was the most profound impact on my life of all the things that I've done in my life, my college, my prep school, being in the New Hampshire State Senate, So many things, but the most profound effect on the person that I became was the impact that Mowgli had on me. I went from a quiet, retiring kid uh, to someone filled with exuberance and confidence. I remember Mr. Hart used to talk with us a lot about Colonel Elwell because Mr. Hart understood the importance of, of us seeing ourselves in the broader spectrum of the Mowgli era. And I suspect, no, I more than suspect, Nick Robbins 
will join that pantheon of great directors. In 10 years, Nick has brought Mowgli from the shadow of its greatness back to life. We're all grateful for that. His exuberance, his enthusiasm, his love of Mowgli is palpable. And you'll see that from this podcast. So without further ado, here's Nick. And by the way, you'll notice, unlike other podcasts, I hardly say a word because I knew that Nick's enthusiasm was going to carry him through this podcast. And all I had to do was sit back smile and nod here's nick robbins and there he is hey wayne how's it going all right what do you got, Jackson? Let me turn Holbrook? my, my uh, phone off here. Good. <laughs> well, well, we both had nice backdrops today. Yeah, this is um, uh, this is especially for you. This is the this was the very first swim of the centennial summer at Mowgli. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. Awesome. That must have been a nice. So that was the was that the year after reopening or was that the reopening year after the year off was the uh, let's see i think it was the reopening year wow. 2003 yeah. but i you know i yeah. get a little bit mixed up here but uh well we'll be there soon i can't wait yeah yeah uh, all those kids <laughs> joyfully jumping into the water for the first time <laughs> i know and and uh I think, you know, with spring this year, I don't think it's going to be a cold first uh, few weeks in the lake. I think, you know. Yeah, that's probably right. We didn't have a particularly icy winter down there. so. Well, I'm going to introduce you, but it's uh, almost uh, irrelevant uh, to say that I have the uh, great pleasure of speaking today with Nick Robbins, who is uh, are you entering your 11th year at this point? You've yeah, I guess so. It kind of depends on how you count it. Uh, 2013, I was shadowing Sam Punderson. Uh, so 20, uh, yeah, 14 was my first okay. year as director. Yeah. The first year I recruited for and, and hired for. But um, yeah, I mean, it's been a decade, maybe a little bit more. So And, it's, and what a transformation. It's, it's been an uh, yeah, I, I know it's been a lot of hard work for you and for your team, uh, which is an extraordinary bunch of people. It is. And, yeah. uh, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how you came to Mowgli and um, perhaps some perspective from me on the um, kind of the waves and winds that you faced in 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 landing this job to begin with sure. i mean there were an awful lot of mowgli who said well we gotta have somebody who who went to mowgli definitely <laughs> yeah understandably you know the the program and its traditions and uh the mowgli way is is so critical to the institution yeah what what it you know we always talk about the impact of Mowgli and it is all of that and so if someone were to come in and want to dramatically change the structure of the camp or the length of the session or the focus of the program you know that would really impact the impact that the camp has on on kids uh, which is deeply profound as you know you know when I started. Uh, I remember Chris Faniff, who was the, the board president at the time, sent me a list of uh, Mowgli alumni to really 
sort of do a, 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 a listening tour with. So that first summer I met with a lot of folks, you included, yeah. to get a sense of the place's lasting impact. And I spoke with Alan Brown. Uh, Frank Punderson drove me down to Alan Brown's house in Connecticut, who is just turning 100 years old right. and still telling dramatic and, and youthful stories of his time at, at camp under Colonel Elwell as director. And uh, it's just, anyway, we, we, we'll, we'll get there. I'll, 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 but we'll talk a little bit about the process that brought you to Mowgli. I mean, yeah. both in terms of the person you were at the time and, and then what you went through. So thanks for the invitation, Wayne, as well. This is cool. Uh, and um, gosh, I think we're at 45 days till camper arrival now. So it's just around the, the, the corner. It's kind of nice to have a, a calm moment to reflect here. Cause uh, so I first attended overnight camp. Um, I, I was uh, nine or 10 and my parents you know, knew that I needed something productive to do over the summer. We lived in Rhode Island and, and Rhode Island is a lovely place, but they, they get this, get this kid out of the suburbs for the summer and, and do something fun. And my dad had heard through colleagues about a boys camp called Camp Northwoods, which is also a really great New Hampshire camp. It's owned and operated by the Boston YMCA. Uh, and in, in many respects, Mowgli kind of reminds me of Northwoods is a very simple facility on a lake where you're going to learn to, you know, canoe, sail. I learned how to water ski there. Uh, first time I fired a rifle was there. Um, and I'll never forget, we hiked, and I think it was, I believe it was either Chikorua. Um, I, I think it was Chikorua. I was too young to really remember, but we, we took a hike and we got stuck in a thunderstorm near the summit and we were kind of hunkered down in a, in a, a under overhanging rock. And I just remember this feeling of being alive and talking with the counselor, is just, everything going to be okay? Yeah, everything's going to be okay. You know, and, and just really feeling, like I said, alive and, and, and energized by this adventure that we were on. And so I attended Northwoods for two summers. It was a shorter session. It was just a two-week camp, uh, but really loved it and fell in love with the outdoor adventure component uh, of, of that experience. And so I, a friend of mine uh, at home who we bonded over archery, right? We, we do archery. Another thing I picked up at camp um, told me about this camp that his sister had gone to in Vermont where they... Uh, canoed and kayaked off waterfalls and that sounded really great to me so i ended up going to that camp it's called adventure quest um it was, uh, was a small uh, little program and it is no longer in existence unfortunately um but worked there well i attended there when i was 11 12 and 13 loved every second of it kayaking rock climbing backpacking were the focuses of my time there learned how to rock climb there uh, turned into a lifelong passion um, and actually was on the junior staff there from age 14 every summer through high school. So, you know, end of the school year in Rhode Island, I would go to Vermont and we were intense in doing road trips to different paddling and climbing locations throughout New England all summer long. And uh, that, you know, reluctantly get back to Rhode Island for the school year and and you know Rhode Island where I grew up is a lovely place to be but it was a little bit too tame for me you know kind of a suburb and on Narragansett Bay and then the second school would end I would I would go back to Vermont um and so camp for me was always sort of this light at the end of the school year tunnel where I, I it's a similar feel to that nine-year-old Nick Robbins in the cave on Mount Chikora going wow this is living right? This is, I'm the, I'm the, the, I'm a part of this awesome thing. Uh, and uh, so it was always just a really, really big part of my life. It's where I met some of the best, most inspirational people I've ever met. And I think it really formed me as a, 
as a human being, I, it's where I picked up Willer's first aid. Uh, you know, took my first Willer's first aid certification class when I think I was 16. That's all it's been a big part of my life. Uh, it's where I really learned to teach. You know, at age 14, 15, 16 years old, I was teaching kids my own age and younger how to rock climb and how to safely do dangerous things, which has been a big part of my life. You know, giving people the tools and the training to take calculated risks. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, working at camp, being a camp guy guided me to desire to have jobs where I felt like I was making the world a better place by inviting people into the wilderness, helping them find their strength, find their courage, uh, and helping them develop the skills to do so safely and responsibly. Um, so I, you know, uh, was riding up a ski lift with my dad, I think I was 12 or 13 years old, and he's a psychiatrist. Uh, we were chatting about jobs and, and what he does, and there was a ski patroller digging out a lift tower pad uh and and i said that's a pretty cool job and i said well maybe maybe one day if i you know strike it rich i'll i'll, I'll do that and he goes well you know if, if you do something you love it doesn't matter how much money you make and that that statement has stuck with me and he was talking about himself as well you know he he's he helps people with mental health issues uh live you know happier and more productive lives. And, and that's something that for me has always been really a big part of my drive as a human being. If I'm going to work, I'm going to do something. I want to help people. I want to help the world be a better place. And camp for me was that, you know, it was, it was what would give me the strength and, 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 and drive to, you know, kind of struggle through middle school and high school. And it's why I became a philosophy major in college, uh, kind of trying to think about the, the big issues confronting mankind and, and hopefully make my time on earth here a positive force for others. Um, and then after college, uh, so Adventure Quest, the camp I worked out for so many years, had their last summer, the summer I graduated from college, uh, which was 2000. And when they closed, I was admittedly a little bit of a drift, uh, a, a little bit of drift. I had been with that organization for so long. Uh, it had been such an important part of my life and it just, it, it closed. And it was, you know, it was a real loss and it coincided with graduating from college going, okay, well, what do I do now? Um, and so Basically, following the most important parts of my camp experiences, I, uh, I, I became a teacher. I taught environmental education for a year for a program called Nature's Classroom. Uh, I became an EMT, an emergency medical technician. Uh, and when I was teaching environmental ed, I was also the on-site uh, medical person, uh, so sort of in place of a camp nurse. Uh, and... <laughs> To, to pay bills, I also worked food service, you know, cooked in, in a breakfast and lunch place, diner for a, a little while, while I was getting my EMT certification. And if you think about the, the skills that a camp director pretty much needs to have, uh, they, they, they need to be able to cook for people and do <laughs> lots of dishes uh, and work with people who cook right? It's not always the easiest thing. They need to have a kind of baseline medical background, right? You right. get a sense of, you know, how to keep people healthy and happy and what, what escalates to a higher uh, level of, of, of medical need. And they need to be teachers. Uh, and, you know, being a, being a camp guy, you know, or gal or, or person, you're teaching every single day in everything that you do. Um, and so here I was, um, you know, teaching the EMT, working in a diner at times. And I had an opportunity to join the um, summer staff of a really great camp called Camp Cody, 
which had, uh, you know, for reasons I won't go into, there is a, it's a private family owned camp. There had been a, a, a divorce that kind of caused the camp to falter and actually didn't run for, I think, three summers. And my first summer there is the Camp EMT was their second summer uh, reopening. And it was kind of contentious with the family that owned it. You know, the, the, it was not, a, not a, a happy situation for them. And I was somebody who had zero connection with any of that. And I was an EMT, I was a teacher, and I could help out in, in, the, in the dish room uh, as needed. Uh, and so basically, uh, it was, it was a kind of a right, right guy, right place, right time for all parties involved. Uh, my first summer there as the nurse's assistant was 2002. Uh, and it was, it was great. It was great to be back at camp. Um, I, that summer I signed on for half the summer, I was going to go out to Yosemite and, and climb El Capitan and Half Dome with two uh, climbing buddies from college. Um, but I was in the middle of summer. Why would I, how could I leave this? You know, they, 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 they need me here. And I was working great with the camp nurse and uh, I knew all the kids and it was like, Oh, great to be back at camp. Um, that semester after that, I taught in vinyl ed again. And that winter, uh, Cody's uh, leadership basically uh, had, they were in relative kind of chaos and, and asked me if I would help out on a year round basis, given, you know, I knew all the counselors and staff from the previous summer. I knew all the kids, all the parents. And that was my entry into camp administration. That's how I got going was basically me in the office of Camp Cody the sole administrator with a really great facility with a lot of history, a lot of pictures on the wall uh, that needed somebody, some, some fresh momentum. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how I got into camp on a year round basis. And I was, I met my wife there that summer. Uh, she, Deanna was over from Romania on a J one visa. At the end of that summer, she actually coincidentally won the green card lottery uh, and was able to stay in New Hampshire. And we worked together at, at Camp Cody and rebuilt that program um, over the following decade. I became director in 2005. And we went from, you know, 80 or 90 kids a summer there. It's a two week session, four uh, sessions uh, is their summer. To my, I think my last summer, we had something like 650 kids total. And it was wonderful. It, you know, we got them accredited with the American Camp Association, uh, really just established a stable camp there. I had a great mentor there who was one of the parties who had gotten divorced, and he was, uh, you know, running things in Portsmouth in a program that he uh, ran down there, an education program. And he was also just, his name's Philip Ross, he's very helpful in my growth as a camp director gave me a ton of responsibility, a ton of leeway. And I, 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 at times I, I wonder how uh, sane he was because I was an unproven entity, you know, but he saw some potential with me and, and took, a, took a gamble. And, and I'd, I'd like to think we all benefited. You know, I got Cody uh, really successful, almost to the point where it was too big for me. You know, I'm, as a camp guy, I like to know all the kids. I like to know all the parents. I, I really enjoy watching them grow year to year. And with 650 kids a summer, that's just, I don't, I don't, I can't remember that many names, Wayne, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, the, the private for-profit camp world is different than the nonprofit camp world. That's more mission driven more about the impact it has on kids necessarily, whereas private for-profit, it's, you know, they just have a, a different financial uh, structure. It's more, it's more, uh, more of a moneymaker. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what led me to feel like, well, maybe, maybe there's another step here. 
And uh, I actually, I learned about Mowgli from uh, my predecessor, Sam Punderson, because he and his wife ran a part of the program at Adventure Quest. Uh, and so I had known those guys for years. And when Sam got the job in 2009, he reached out and said, hey, Nick, I, I'm, I'm the New Hampshire camp director. What, you know, what are some things I need to know? Like, you know, <laughs> and so we had a great conversation. And up until that point, I really hadn't heard about Magley. Magley had been doing a great job at sort of coasting and staying below the radar. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to cast any shade here, but the business was not thriving. Uh, it was, you know, it was yeah. a point in time where the seven week session structure of Magley, I think, was being called into question. You know, a lot of people wanted shorter sessions. Uh, a lot of people wanted, you know, more specialized athletic camps, soccer camps, baseball camps, lacrosse camps. And of course, Mowgli has this awesomely eclectic group of industries, right? Bugling, axemanship, woodworking, crew. And so it didn't really fit into like sort of mainstream camp. Uh, and, but it's still wonderful. Uh, and Sam, uh, obviously, Sam did a really good job of sort of getting the the business practices uh, up to date. You know, he brought in um, some really good, uh, you know, for instance, our camp management software system that we use. He brought that in. You know, he kind of kept brought Mowgli up to speed. Um, and in our correspondences, I learned about Magley and went, wow, that place looks amazing. You know, it's this traditional back to basics boys summer camp on a glorious lake, but it also had many of the outdoor adventure activities that were near and dear to me right. that ran at the same time. So it was like this, this almost this, this perfect medley of Camp Northwoods and Adventure Quest. And I just, I, I really took a shine to Mowgli and, and enjoyed learning about it from Sam. Uh, and when he announced his departure, I mean, he gave 18 months notice to the board. Uh, and for family reasons, it was hard for him to work at Mowgli and leave his wife and son who were based in Carabasset Valley, uh, Maine for the full summer. Um, and that's a, that's a big ask for anybody. Yeah. But he, you know, he gave a, a, a lot of really good notice. And at that point, um, the camp's uh, board uh, opened up a, a national search for the next director, Mowgli. And uh, I saw the posting in the American Camp Association's year-round jobs at camp newsletter and basically immediately sent in my resume uh, and went, well, this is, this is a long shot, but this would be amazing. Uh and so, gosh, I mean, it, it took about 18 months. So it was May of 2013, May 17th, to be exact, of 2013, that I met with the board of directors uh, after several interviews and, and sort of stages of the search um, and just laid out my vision for what Ma Mowgli could be and what my what my year would look like at Mowgli uh, from September to the end of August and uh, from recruiting campers to staff, to all of the, all of the different things that go into a Mowgli summer and, and they liked what they heard. So on my drive home, Chris fan of called me and said, Mr. Robbins, the board has voted and we would like to welcome you to become the next director of, of Mowgli. And I had to pull over. I was shaking uh, and, and said, absolutely, you know, no hesitation. And it was bittersweet because, you know, I'd really, you know, when you get, when you're applying for a job, it seems perfect. You know, I was in a good place at, at Cody. I put in a lot of good years there made a lot of really great friends, watched a lot of, of, of kids grow there. And it became really real that this would be a big, a big step. Um, but it was also, a very important step for me because it went from the, the, the for-profit camp world to the mission-driven nonprofit camp world. And, you know, the, the, I keep it above my computer, but the mission of Camp Mowgli is to develop, to 
to develop integrity, empathy, resilience, and leadership in young men through the time-tested and fun outdoor experiential program and community we call it School of the Open, right? And I read that every day because that mission drives literally everything we do from the counselors we hire to how we talk to parents about camp, to how we train our staff, to how we run the program. It's a, it's a youth development program versus sort of a, a resort for kids. And that for me is what camp's all about. It's what it was about since I was nine years old. And uh, so my first summer, uh, 2013, uh, we had at Magley, I'm looking at my table right here. We had roughly, well, I can tell you exactly. It was, it was not great. Uh, we had 40, we had 35 full season kids in 2013. Uh, we had four three week Cubs and 12 four week campers. The camp was, was kind of a ghost town that, that summer. And I knew things were challenging. Uh, I knew the camp uh, had, had some hurdles to overcome, but I, I al always knew in my heart that Mowgli had the potential to re-attain its spot as really a, a, a top tier camp and a camp that had the kind of impact that these alumni had been telling me about. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was an exciting time. It still is, uh, to, to be able to tell people about what a great institution Mowgli is and to point to people like you and others who swear that it had a deeply profound impact on who they are, on their beliefs, on their ethics, on how they show up in the world. Yeah. And so to be a part of an organization like that has been awesome. It hasn't always been easy. You know, we've had our, our challenges, uh, but you know, this summer as we approach uh, the start date, we've got uh, 80 full season guys in the pack and nine uh, full season Cubs. So we're, we're basically there. You know, and we've got some a couple shorter season kids as well. Uh, so it's it's been a wild ride, uh, but I feel like we've really gotten back to where uh, it should be. And that's that's the story. That's where I am. Well, and I mean, we we obviously did the uh, the the Wikipedia version. I was going to say Reader's Digest version, but that's for our yeah. older alums. The, the Wikipedia version yeah. <laughs> is what yeah. it is today. And, uh, but I would like to sort of explore a little bit about sort of the short, maybe the short story of how you, how you got your head into the Mowgli space before yeah. you met with the trustees and were hired. Ah, uh, gosh. So, <laughs> I literally read every single word on every single page of the website. Uh, got to, I read howls. Like yeah. be before we even started, I had read the howls, the calls, yeah, uh, the, the the bios of the trustees to get just get a sense of the place. Because I mean, if I was going to make a big step at that point, I had two young children, a house. You know, this, this was this was a big deal. You don't make these these types of life changes, uh, you know, uh, willy nilly and, and really just talking with Sam, uh, you know, he had a long history at the camp. He attended as a boy, his dad and, and his, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of Plundersons, uncles, cousins have attended and just getting a sense of the immense impact that the place has had on so many. Um, and summer of 2012, my wife, Deanna and I did a, uh, an overnight visit and, uh, basically just kind of showed up at the end of the day, uh, watched colors. Uh, we were around for campfire, did a, a tour of the camp with, with Sam. Um, 
and I, I mean, I just, I remember how quiet camp was at nine 30 and the kids were all, they were into the, into the routine of camp. And by the time it was, it was, it was right around crew week. And, you know, by then the pack has formed such a tight bond for that summer. Um, it just, I could feel the energy. I could just, I, it was, it's hard to describe, but you've experienced it. You know, you watch how everything runs. You see that duty board being changed. You hear the bugle calls. You just get a sense of, okay, this is, this is a thing, right? This is an institution that, um, you know, it's fun and it's friendly, but it's very orderly. Uh, and the kids, you know, I love watching, we had breakfast, we sat at the household table and one of the guys at the table was Gary Wright, who's an alumnus and he was back to run the rifle range. Uh, and, you know, just hearing him tell stories of when he was a camper and this little guy, you know, comes to the table holding this huge tray, you know, putting it down and it's, you know, it is the table boy, just kind of watching all these little aspects of the camp and how it functions and have, has its own culture. And, and that culture gives little kids big responsibilities, you know, and, and they, a, a, a saying that I had developed um, is that Mowgli gives young men the, the opportunity to step up and rise to the occasion. And it, it really does, you know, it gives them that you, you can go either way when you're holding that tray, you know? And uh, so that sort of a little snapshot into how I learned about the program. And that was, that was a, a snapshot. I uh, woke up, that was uh, the last, actually, you know, it was the last full week of camp. So it was the cardigan, the all camp uh, cardigan hike that day. And just enjoyed seeing everybody get ready for trip day, you know, saving their knives for trail lunches and making their lunches, heading out to go hike, which is something that, you know, for me is just absolutely essential to the camp experience, walking uphill, climbing a mountain, getting to the top and knowing that everybody in that dining hall was doing that together that day. It wasn't elective. It was what they were doing. Um, it just, it was obvious to me that this was something I want to be a part of, something I'd be really at home at, um, which was the way I felt since that first time setting foot on the property, which was, yeah, this feels right. Yeah. Well, it's, it, I mean, it's not only clear from, uh, my observations and those of, of, uh, my friends and colleagues that, that you see yourself as an, a part of an organic place, you know, that it's not, there, there's so many instances in life where you have a director or CEO, whatever the title happens to be, who's sort of above the fray and not, not uh, filling in for the cook when he's not feeling well, or she's not feeling well and not serving Sunday dinners and all that, but, but you're doing that. And that, and what it reminded me of was a conversation that I had with one of the world's most famous philosophers, since you were a philosophy student yourself, Dan Dennett, who was at Mowgli, yeah. who said he became a philosopher because Colonel Elwell told him that he was a philosopher. <laughs> yeah. Such Profound. Something about camp, you know, it's, it's so clear at camp, these, these the ethical questions, right? These questions of, uh, I think it was Dodging, he said, we know we need to do something in life. The question is what? And that's always been a question that I've asked, you know, from a little, little guys, you know, what, what do I do? And camp, it, when it's 7.15, it's time to play revelry. You know, <laughs> you got to get out of bed. You got to show up for the day. It's very clear. Um, and unfortunately, 
you probably know this. Uh, we lost Dan, uh, uh, Dan recently. So I had not heard. I I was in touch with him two months ago, so I didn't know that he had passed. Well, he was he was an amazing man. Anyway, um, uh, it, but one of the things that this brings up was something you mentioned earlier, and that is that there was a lot of pressure to move Mowgli to a, a you know a two week set of two week sessions and all that. Talk about the difference um, that you see, particularly with ten years of experience behind you, between a camp that is basically a summer long experience every summer and a camp that's a week or two. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm an outspoken believer in camp. And so a, 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 a four night camp experience, you know, environmental ed type experience, nature's classroom type experience is better than nothing. And I think all kids should go to camp. And I hope they do. And one of the things I love about Magla is our scholarship programs help kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend camp come to camp. That said, it's easy for quiet kids to sort of slip through the cracks, right? It's easy for uh, kids who maybe aren't as, as boisterous to sort of coast. One of the things I love about Magley is that every kid is known at camp because there's no turnover over the summer. You know, the, the pack is the pack. And by and large, the kids who show up on arrival day are the kids who are there all summer long. So it forms this cohesion, this group, the Magley pack, which you just don't get when you have a multi-session camp with people coming and going all summer. Um, if you attend Mowgli in 2020, you know, four this coming summer, you're going to know every kid at camp from the seven-year-olds, the 15-year-olds, and you're going to know who they are. You're going to have a, 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 a relationship, friendship, probably with them. Uh, whereas a camp with a, you know, one or two week session, that's just not going to happen. Right. Also Mowgli is a relatively small camp by comparison. Uh, you know, look at the the camp I was at before. We had you know a good a good session. We hope to have two hundred and twenty five kids uh, on on site, and there's no way that anybody is going to really get to know two hundred twenty five people in two weeks. It's impossible. Right. Uh, so that when it comes to the counselors knowing the kids, when it comes to the kids knowing each other, when it comes to the director knowing all the kids. Uh, a, a shorter session camp just makes that a lot harder to happen. Uh, again, any camp experience is, is better than none. Uh, but, you know, I, I look at camp in terms of, I call it the three P's of camp. You got the people, the program, and the property, right? And for us, right, we have an amazing group of people. We're, we, we are very fortunate to have an amazing group of people. We were very hard on that. In terms of staffing all year long, uh, we're very, very fortunate to have an amazing campus. You know, our property is, you know, it's amazing. You know, Mrs. Holt picked well. <laughs> um, but the program is really what defines Mowgli. You know, we 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 have a sweet spot in terms of the size of the camp population and the length of the session. And the different activities that we offer, it creates this community that, you know, there's kids that are, are more into uh, water sports. There's kids that love the target sports. There's kids that love uh, theater or arts and crafts or woodworking. And that's great. There's a place for them. There's really a place for them. But th they're, they're a member of that community. So whether they're boisterous and out, you know, being loud and, 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 and silly or more quiet and reserved, they're, they're going to have a place at camp. They're going to they're gonna have people who know who they are and, and, and value them and 
see them and hear them. And if they're not there, I'm going to go, Hey, where's, you know, where, where's Nick? Yeah. Right. Um, and I think everybody can remember a time when, when they were a, a kid where, you know, maybe they weren't the loudest and they were sort of on the periphery and the, the grownups knew the, the kids that were a little bit more uh, upfront and, and loud. Uh, and, and everybody needs to be seen. Everybody needs to be heard. Everybody needs to be valued. And I know that happens in that way. So, yeah, I think, I, that I think as a kid, I, I went through, I mean, I was the quiet kid in, in, in my dorm. And then, you know, what I grew into was an obnoxious counselor. I was going to say, it's quite a transformation. <laughs> Leading the Zamboni brothers and <laughs> doing all that wild stuff. But, uh, you know, that's, that was the evolution that took place at Maugli. Yeah. Giving but, you that opportunity to step up to the plate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I was a Denite and I learned that I could make a fire in the rain, mm. it was like a whole new world opened up. Mm. Yeah. And, and that confidence in yourself and that sense of that can do spirit uh, that travels home with you yeah, and extends to your school year, to your professional life. I know for, for me, I mean, I, I said it before, but camp was like the, it would put the wind in my sails to carry me through the school year and have the confidence that I could do hard things. Uh, and I, and that I was, you know, capable and that I had, value to a situation yeah uh, and and you know look i i had a, a great childhood i it, it was but camp really gave me just like you described a relatively quiet young man that then used an opportunity to kind of stand and to to the challenge presented and so uh so Another Mowgli fellow that uh, that I wanted to bring up because of, uh, of the importance of Mowgli to the education of the person is Tony Wagner, who I know you you know well, and uh, and he yeah. speaks of the Mowgli experience as being a real critical component to his uh, his development as an educator. It's it's interesting you bring up Tony and he visited relatively early on in my directorship and walked around and you know I at that point I didn't really know him that well uh, or or his body of of work um, in the educational uh, space um, but one thing he said when we walked around was you know everything you're doing here is education. You know, people, people minimalize camp as fun, but everything these kids are doing, they're both teaching and learning. And I, I, I was like, yeah, somebody said what I've been thinking. <laughs> you know, you had those where I was like, yeah, of course. And I think that's something that, you know, post college for me, um, I was thinking about ways to bring camp to my life professionally in other venues, be it teaching mm -hmm. or being an emergency medical technician. Um, and I needed somebody probably earlier on in my life to say, you know, camp is really important. Camp is education. Follow that. <laughs> and fortunately, my heart led me to camp anyway. Uh, and I'm so glad it did professionally and personally. Um, but yeah, Tony's a great guy. And, and I mean, it goes all the way back to Colonel Elwell, who wrote his, his uh, dissertation. I'm looking for it right here. It's uh, right. His, the summer camp, a new factor in education His uh, right. Harvard uh, dissertation in education, which, you know, I, 1925. So the, the idea that camp is truly an essential part of 
the education of a young person has been something has been a part of Mowgli's program for a century, century. Uh, and it shows in what we do. Well, Nick, what would you like to say to all the boys? Well, first of all, let me let me say something before I ask you to do that. The what one of the things that you have done so successfully, in my opinion, is is to turn the end of of the these Mowgli Memories podcasts from good hunting to all the brothers of the pack to good hunting to all the brothers and sisters of the pack. Yeah. Um, those who stand on two legs, those who stand on four legs, those who fly and critters that crawl. <laughs> awesome. Um, you have broadened Mowgli's diversity uh, of all kinds. Yeah. And um, that, I think, has been a very conscientious effort by by not only you, but James Hart and and, and others. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, so, uh, from a gender perspective, um, well, I mean, my wife, my wife, Diana is a equal member of the pack and probably more important in many ways because she, she cooks for us all. <laughs> um, our first two summers there, she cooked and did this, the activity scheduling and, uh, she, she now works with Hardy. Uh, and, and they are our head uh, chefs. Uh, and so having women at camp, I think has been, it's really important for, for young men to see women in leadership roles. I think there's a lot of value to a single gender environment developmentally for boys um, to be with boys uh, at camp. Uh, but we've had, uh, women on staff every summer I've been at camp and not just in the kitchen or in the medical center, uh, but we've had female, uh, trip leaders, uh, this summer, our head kayaking instructor is, uh, a woman, uh, who's awesome. You know, she's total rock star. Uh, and, uh, so it's, it's, that's always been important for me. Uh, and one of the things in terms of diversity, both economic and, and racial or ethnic diversity that we're able to do at Mowgli is, is reach out to folks who maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to uh, afford uh, camp tuition or folks who come from backgrounds where camp isn't a part of their thing. They, they haven't, you know, maybe parents didn't grow up going, going to camp. They think it's just a place for so affluent, uh, you know, white kids to go uh, be away from, you know, their their parents for the summer, uh, and and really speak to folks about the impact that the camp has, and say this this is this is going to be a life changing experience for your son, and every year we award about one hundred seventy five thousand dollars of scholarship, need based, that goes to folks of all different economic levels. Uh, some, some parents need a little bit of help to pay for the camp tuition. Uh, others, we have kids on full ride scholarships. We have partnerships with boys and girls clubs and different organizations, different schools and communities where, you know, camp is just not, it would not be an option for them. I uh, have a great partnership with a school in Philadelphia this year, bringing two boys to camp for the full season. Uh, you know, they're 11, they, they live in inner city, Philadelphia, and I can't wait for them to come and jump in the lake, just like the kids behind you in that picture and experience what the school of the open does, you know, it's going to be transformational for them. And so we're always looking for ways to invite new folks to the pack. And this idea that, you know, their parents ask me all the time, well, what kind of kid goes to Mowgli? And I said, I can't, I can't paint the portrait of one kid because we're a community and in any community there's there's all sorts of people and that's what makes it a special place if there's a community with just one type of person that's going to be a pretty bland and boring experience isn't it yeah. so that's always been a big focus of mine and fortunately we have uh, a, a energized 
uh, camp community that helps make these connections. Um, and people like yourself talking passionately about the impact that it had on them. You know, when I describe what Camp Mowgli does for a young person, there's no parent in the world who would say, no, I don't want that for my son. Of course, you want them to be confident. You want them to be courageous. You want them to be resilient. You want them to be empathetic. Yeah. Right. It's, 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 it, it, it's, Take some work though to to break down the barriers to to camp, and uh, I mean one of the things that we're talking about a lot these days is even the full cost of tuition is subsidized by the donations of our alumni. Uh, so everybody's on some level of financial aid. That's right. Uh, you know, and and it, we talk to the kids about that. You build. We don't want them to feel that it's a given that they're at camp and we want them to feel a sense of the, the, the value of the experience and how special it is and how their actions, how they treat each other, how they show up every day is they're essentially ambassadors for this program and all the people that attended before them and all the people they'll attend in the future. Right. So here you are, Nick, 10, 10 years as the director of Mowgli, where, where I think uh, it's fair to say that you've shown that diversity is our superpower. And uh, what do you want to say to, to the brothers and sisters of Mowgli, uh, um, who ha who have been through with you and uh, and those who will come to follow. Let's That's all just be thankful for what we have. Right, we 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 are all so fortunate to have this place, and it's my job right now, and hopefully for the next you know fifteen twenty years or whatever, to make sure that Mowgli stays as strong and is mission driven as it is today uh and and you know the the, the kids need Mowgli more than ever before if you think about mrs holt starting a program that was designed to give young boys and young men time away from the 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 four walls of the classroom to really learn important life lessons and away from the city, away from their parents, frankly, for the summer to grow. And you fast forward to the kids of today who have cell phones in their hands way too much. They're, you know, playing video games to interact with their friends. And, you know, it's, it's just so important. So I think Mowgli is probably, uh, I mean, like it's always been a, a very impactful place, but I think it's probably more important today than ever before. And that's only going to increase as we get more reliant on computers further sort of down the rabbit hole of, of technology, of which I'm, you know, a believer. I, I have a phone. I'm not anti-tech, but for kids to really grow at that critical sort of pre-adolescent age to be at camp on a lake in New Hampshire. I can't think of a better place to be. So, right. Um, and to be unplugged, as as you say, unplugged and authentic. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Nick Robbins, thank you so much for all you have done. Well, Wayne, it's a real honor. It's an, it's, a, I, I remember our first meeting. So to, it gives me goosebumps just to think about you know, <laughs> what's, what's happened over the course of a decade. And, and thank yeah. goodness we were able to get Mowgli back on stable footing. And now that we're here, you know, knock on wood, we're just gonna keep it here and, and keep the school, school of the open going strong. Thanks again, Nick. It's an honor. Thank you, Wayne. Good hunting. Nice to speak with you. The show notes for this podcast can be found 
at mowglymemories.blogspot.com where you can click on over to the Mowgli website, mowgli.org, and make a donation or purchase some merch. There's also a link to my art gallery of uh, Mowgli and New Hampshire images. And uh, you can take a look at those. And if there's something you can't live without, uh, we'll give one half of uh, the, the price of the image, the signed image, to Mowgli in your name. And the other half will go toward the cost of producing these podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Mowgli Memories podcast. And good hunting to all of the brothers and sisters of the pack. Two-legged, four-legged, critters that crawl and birds that fly. <laughs>